Hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Graphicsly's Clip Studio Paint Character Design Workshop. In this workshop, six artists will present across the two-day event. Each artist will cover a different topic in the character design process. We're excited to learn with you. I'm your host for the session, Fahim Niaz. Before we start, we have some housekeeping items to go through. This session will be approximately 60 minutes long. Use the link in pinned message in the chat to ask questions. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. Please respect the presenters during the sessions and only self-promote and exchange social media info during commercials. All sessions will be uploaded to YouTube later on. This workshop is brought to you by Graphicsly, the official distributor of Clip Studio Paint in North America, South America, and Europe. We can't do this without our amazing sponsors, Clip Studio Paint and Wacom. Clip Studio Paint is a versatile graphics app best suited for drawing and painting to create a wide range of content. With a wealth of unique features, it helps to create anything from illustrations over manga to concept art and animation. Whether professional or hobbyist, Clip Studio Paint's natural drawing feeling, along with its comic and manga features, is loved by artists from around the world. And for Wacom, and built specifically with the artist in mind, Wacom's renowned pressure-sensitive and battery-free digital pen tablets and pen displays allow countless artists and designers to realize their creative visions. This session, Posing, is presented by Rachel Ross, also known as Wormforge. Rachel is a freelance character concept artist and 2D illustrator in the games industry, specializing in stylized design. She works primarily on a MOBA projects such as Smite and formerly as a lead on Project Stamina. Now I'll pass the session to Rachel. Can, am I on? Okay. Uh, hi there, uh, I'm Rachel. Uh, he, he pretty much gave you the spiel, so I won't repeat myself too much. I hope you've appreciated seeing my face because you will not be seeing it anymore as it's now completely uh, washed out by this PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, hey, uh, welcome to my presentation. This is uh, posing for character designers. Um, basically, uh, posing is an important part of selling your designs, uh, and it's a powerful tool for storytelling. And so I basically just want to walk you through how I do it, how I approach it, and um, just sort of like give you a breakdown so that you can not only do it, but do it repeatedly, because finding that consistency is really key uh, when you're working professionally. I'm going to try to remember that I'm talking down here. Uh, a little bit about me, just uh, as a little iteration thing here. Uh, I'm a concept artist and an illustrator. Uh, I'm 24. I have a cat named Bean, and you might see her uh, stalking through the background at some point. Um, I know this presentation has been put on by a lot of people who are more like comic artists, uh, which is super awesome, uh, but I'm a production artist. I'm a concept artist for games, so, you know, the stuff I talk about, the way I go about things might be a little bit different for that reason. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Like, definitely, there are different approaches depending upon, like, what you're wanting to do for your career. But uh, currently, I am a contract concept artist at Riot Games. I work on Wild Rift. Uh, I have past experience with Smite. Uh, I've done illustration for Night Shift on Elsie. And I was the lead character chick on uh, Project Stamina. So let's get right into it. Uh so step zero, I like to call it, is should you be going hard on this to begin with? Uh, as a production artist, it's important to know the uh, purpose, like the purpose of your drawing, because you can make the most kick-ass thing ever with an amazing pose with awesome perspective and perfect foreshortening, and your 3D artist is going to look at you in the eye and wonder what you're thinking if you're trying to give that to them as reference material for modeling a character. So. Uh, first, ask yourself what the art is for. Is it concept art? Is it production art? Then it should be simple. The pose should be unobstructive. You should be able to see their whole outfit, their whole face, etc. Uh, but if the art is for like a front-facing audience, if it's more like an illustration, you know, to uh, 
to advertise your works or, or to represent your game or your project, then like go for it. Like go hard on the pose, right? So just always make sure that you know that before you get started. So here's a little example that I, I put in here of like the difference between something that's for production and something that's for like front-facing advertisement, like illustration. Uh, this is just Zhao from Genshin Impact. You can see on the left here that uh, that's production art. That's so the 3D modeler knows what his outfit looks like from multiple angles. Like it's it don't tell you anything about his personality. It doesn't really do anything in that regard. Uh, it's just really good reference material for other artists on your team. And you always want to make sure that you've got your teammates in mind when you're working in a studio setting. And then on the right here, we've got uh, some of his advertisement art from when they were, you know, getting ready to put up his banner. Uh, so the first step that I like to go through is uh, a pretty simple checklist of what I am trying to accomplish with my pose. Uh, I call it POPs. Uh, number one is what is their personality? How is your pose getting across that personality? Number two, what are the major silhouette breaks that they have on their outfit? Oh. Uh, Three, does my character have any props? That can be anything. If they have a pet cat, then maybe the cat is part of the pose. If they have a cool sword, if they have a bow and arrow, uh, anything. Like, just think what what's the relevant thing that the character has. Uh, and then number four, uh, what story am I trying to tell with my pose? Now, this one, you don't always have it. Like, sometimes a pose is just kind of a pose. Like, it's just your character looking sweet, which is totally fine, too. But it's always interesting to, to like, think, like, what am I trying to get across here? Now, something I always bring up uh, is that uh, a lot of artists go through repetitive strain injuries. They, you know, hurt their arms because they draw all the time. Uh, so I am a big proponent of solving your drawings before you start drawing. Uh, if this seems like a lot of preamble to actually getting started with a drawing, well, yeah, it is. Because uh, it's kind of important to do that because you'll save yourself a lot of pain in the long run, both mental strain of trying to think of things because you never want to solve a drawing while you're drawing it, and physical pain if you're someone who's going through that the way that I have. So just as an introduction and talking more about Pops, my little checklist, which character do you like more here? Which one are you more interested in? I'll give you a couple of seconds. I'm guessing you're gonna say A, because A uh, looks better. Well, they're both Dante, but they're just renders of Dante from different games. So like, uh, just to go through it real quick, why I think one pose succeeds and the, others do the other doesn't. Let me pull up. So here we've got a couple of Dantes. And his, his major design beats basically stay the same between iterations, right? He's a guy in a long red coat, he has a sword, and he has two guns. It's pretty simple as things go. Uh, but sometimes when a design is really simple, that makes it uh, sort of more important to really focus in on the pop points of it. So, like, when you break them down to just silhouettes, when you go back to this slide, a is sort of giving you more information about what he's wearing and what he's doing than B is because B's pose sort of like you can't really see anything of his jacket, right? It's sort of in the same place as his legs. You can't really see anything of his sword because it's just straight up behind him. I mean, it's behind him in A too, but like still. And then he doesn't have ebony and ivory at all in B. Like you wouldn't know that he's a character with guns at a glance. So it's always important to be thinking of that kind of stuff. So uh, after you've sort of done the preamble to posing your character, thinking through who the character is, what they do, what they might have, how they are looking. Um, I see someone in the chat said that inside you are two wolves. One is Dante and the other is Dante. That's true. Uh, but after you've sort of gone through the preamble of finding your pose, finding your character, you have to find your gesture. Now, um, basically, a lot of people get confused about the difference like, between gesture drawing and anatomy drawing, like figure drawing. Uh, gesture is basically the type of drawing that focuses on the flow of a pose or like the emotion that it evokes rather than like 
the raw anatomical features of the body. So you'll often find a lot of exaggeration in these kinds of drawings, a lot of simplification, which I think is really helpful. If you've never like tried to practice gesture before, then I highly recommend it. Uh, one theory I want to bring up is Walt Stansfield's string of pearls theory of gesture drawing, which is basically that, um, let me swap back over to my window here. So like, say you're drawing an arm, you've got like the collarbone there and then the shoulder comes down. And you've got like the bicep and everything. Like this is kind of a lot of bumps, isn't it? Like it's kind of complicated as a shape. So the idea is that uh, you basically find the lowest point of the arm and that becomes your string. It's your string. And then the muscles are like pearls that go along it. So you can essentially simplify the gesture of the arm all the way down to this much easier to follow line. Not only is this line a lot simpler to draw, it also tends to be easier to express motion uh, when you're sort of simplifying something down to a gesture. So like you've got your string, you've got your pearls. So always remember where your string is. If you can find your string, you can construct the anatomy over it. Pop back in here. Now, when you're talking about gesture and you're talking about poses in general, uh, something really important to know is about the rhythm of a pose and uh, a concept called contrapposto. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly, but contrapposto, it's basically the idea that uh, very simplistically contrapposto is just that the axes of your uh, hips and your shoulders will be uh, like sort of pointing away from each other. This has to do with how your body distributes weight. Um, so I have this little draw over here I did um, to sort of express uh, like the natural rhythm and flow of a pose when you've like properly distributed the weight. Now, something to know like is that you can kind of intuit this back and forth in a pose. Even if you've never studied something like this, you can tell when a pose looks too stiff, like the weight isn't distributed properly. There's not really that feeling of organicness. Uh, so uh, what I hope to do with pointing this out to you is just to give you the like vocabulary to be able to talk about it and to see it in other poses and then to apply it to your own work. So like talking about rhythm, it's, it's a pretty abstract word for a pose, but basically it's the idea that like things sort of go back and forth where there's a compression on one side, there'll be a stretch on another where one leg is straight, the other will be bent like that kind of thing. You always want to like see where you can find that in your pose because it'll help it make, help it feel a lot more natural and like your character's not a stiff robot with a metal skeleton. Uh, so it's a really complicated topic that you can teach whole classes on by itself, so I won't get too much further into it, uh, but I will post this PowerPoint later if it helps. Uh, after you've found the gesture, it's time to sort of apply the anatomy over the gesture. Now, I'm a big proponent of always focusing your gesture first because like, I find that when you work too anatomically too fast, like you, you get ahead of yourself, it really stiffens poses up. Like you sort of lose focus a little bit. Um, you'll find that some of the best artists, like especially like stylized artists, the way that I am, like they will sort of push and pull at the anatomy a little bit to further accentuate and improve upon the pose. Uh, so, um, if this is something that stresses you out, don't worry, it stresses out everybody. Anatomy is hard. Uh, but it is something that gets steadily easier with time. And uh, like as your confidence grows with it, as you understand it more and more, it'll feel easier and easier to sort of uh, like adjust for what you're wanting. Uh, so when you're getting started with like applying anatomy over a gesture, I really like um, Bridgman's uh, style of construction, which is basically uh, a form of simplification that focuses on the rib cage and the pelvis. Those are the two big things you sort of need to know the relative positions of. And basically you'll simplify them down 
into like sort of a box or a Personally, I like to turn the rib cages into more of like an like an oval, but you can turn them into a box. You can turn them into like a, basically the idea is that you're boiling down complicated shapes into simple shapes because that makes it way easier to tell what angle your body is facing. Like part of that uh, natural feeling, that contrapposto or whatever, is like knowing how to angle things and sort of adjust them. Like sometimes like your torso is at a different angle from your pelvis, like, and uh, being able to simplify things down to boxes will help you find that angle way easier. Like if you can avoid overthinking something early, do it. Like as long as you have a solid idea of the proportion of a body, you really can boil things down into these simple shapes. Now, uh, I've created a meme here, the, but, like, it's totally okay if you find, like, one artist's method doesn't really work for you, like, you don't jive with it. Like, you know, there are all these classical artists that, you know, people recommend you, like Bridgman that I was talking about, uh, and sometimes you're just not clicking with it. Uh, it's important to know, like, Having an art style doesn't preclude you from learning the fundamentals, the fundies. Uh, but like everybody has a different style of learning and understanding and application. So like find the way that's best for you and don't feel guilty if something doesn't work for you the way that it works for other people because you can find your own way through it. You can combine a lot of different methods and find the way that makes you happy. I accidentally moved Dante here. He was originally in the back. But here I have some of my art that I wanted to go through with the little pops method uh, and just sort of find the gesture in them before we move on. So here's a character that I drew. Uh, her personality, you know, she's tough, she's reserved, she's confident. She's got a pose that's not super crazy uh, because she's kind of got that reserved nature. So like sometimes even when a pose is sort of restrained, it can inform you about the character. Like it's not necessarily something that's bad if a pose is restrained because sometimes you've got a character that's just not gonna be doing something crazy. Uh, her major silhouette break on her outfit is that she's got this big cloak. Like her actual outfit, you can see here in the silhouette, uh, it's pretty constrained to her body's proportions. Uh, so the cloak is the big thing that breaks, along with like her feathered sort of looking hair. You can see that, like the little feathers on her cloak there, but the cloak is the main thing. And then her prop, she has her little shadowy bow and arrow. And the story, you know, it's not too serious on this one. Like it's not too crazy. She's just sort of like manifesting that bow and arrow. So there's like sort of the VFX work there to help, uh, help accomplish that. Uh, here's some other art that I did. This one, uh, this one is of like a sort of puppet master character. I wanted a creepy feeling on this one. So her personality, you know, she's unsettling. She's spiritual looking, like she's clearly got some kind of weird connections. Uh, and then her outfit is a lot more complicated than the last one. Her big silhouette breaks her that she has this ornamental headpiece. She's got this veil and then she's got this robe down here that breaks around her legs and her hips. Uh, and then her prop is her puppet. She's got her cool puppet. Uh, and then the story that I'm trying to get across is sort of like this feeling of like who's controlling who, right? Like she looks almost as puppet-like as her puppet. Like they're both sort of off kilter. Like uh, there's not a clear sense of her balance and that's on purpose. She's sort of like floating almost. So like a lot of different things can... Uh, lend themselves to the vibe that your pose has. Like, I know I was talking a lot about the way that weight is distributed before, but even if your character is standing in a way where their weight is distributed weirdly, it will still tell a story about them. Like, you know, maybe you've got a character who's older, uh, like they're hunched over, and so they're supporting part of their weight on a cane. Like, a lot of this stuff really lends to storytelling. Um, now I'm going to swap over to, now very quickly I have her pulled back up here because I sort of want to demonstrate to you, um, excuse me one moment, I need a sip. 
because I want to demonstrate basically how I went about this kind of gesture and how you can break down the gestures you see in other people's drawings. So I'm just going to draw this blue line here. This is sort of the major line of action that she has, right? Like her whole body is following this one C curve. And then the puppet has its own C curve here. Like if you boil down the feeling, the gesture of this drawing, it's just these C curves. Uh, but having a really strong gesture line and basing your pose around it will give it such a, a more dynamic feeling because when you have this solid foundation, like you have the strong idea of where you want a pose to go, what you want it to do, um, that makes it way easier to use the tertiary elements of a drawing to sort of support it. Like she's got these flowing cloth bits and they all sort of like spawn outwards and flow from that C curve. So like you have this sense of direction that she's like sort of toddling that way while her, her veil is tossing with the motion of her head. It provides a sense of like sort of lifelikeness to your drawing. Uh, so it's always important to be thinking about that kind of thing. And like, I can't like sort of impress it upon you enough that like take it slow when you're learning, take it slow. There's no need to rush into like any kind of drawing. Like you can take it slow. You can find, you can find your idea and just sort of push it outwards. Like I think a lot of like starting out artists, um, they get really super concerned about getting to the end product fast. Like, you know, because you see all this sick art online, it's like, holy cow, like, how did they do that? But like, you focus so much on the end product that you lose the process of making it. Like, you don't know how long it took this super awesome professional artist to make that cool thing you saw on ArtStation. You don't know how much like they had to learn and mess with it in the process. So like, be kind to yourself, be patient. It like the only difference between you and that professional is time. It's not skill, it's time. Everything is just time. There's theoretically nothing stopping you from being able to draw like this professional you idolize or anything. There's nothing stopping you except time, the amount of time that you're willing to put into a single piece or into your whole art journey. So, uh, I know I kind of blitzed through that, but I wanted to try and try and get a little bit of time to uh, to demo while I talk, and uh, hopefully this can help cement the things that I've already talked about. Um, so I want to draw a, a character that <clears throat> one of my friends actually made, one of my dear friends, uh, because she has this big floofy skirt that I love. I love to draw skirts, and I love having like outfits that have a lot of flowing cloth because they can really lend to a feeling of gesture. So, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little drawing here. Now, let's start with our pops. This character's personality, she is earnest. Uh, she's a little nervous. She's, she's unsure of herself. We'll add unsure as its own little bullet point here. Uh, and something to know about her is that she's a magic character. She's a, she's a mage. So we'll see if we can get that across in her little brief. Um, so with the personality out of the way, what's going on with her outfit? Well, she's wearing a big skirt. So we'll see how we can use this big skirt to accentuate the pose and to play with her character. Uh, she also has a big ponytail. <laughs> so that can also help us with this sense of flow. Now, uh, does she have any props? No, uh, no props, but she's a mage. So we'll see if we can do some VFX instead. Uh, and then finally, what story are we trying to tell? Well, the story that we're going to try to tell is uh, more informative of her, her personality here. We're just gonna see if we can accentuate these aspects of her. <clears throat> so let's see what we can do. 
So she's a nervous character. She's unsure of herself. She's maybe a little bit quick to rush into things. So we're going to try to find a pose that can kind of like uh, communicate that sense of like, she's got a lot of growing to do. She's a character who's moving forward. So sort of like how I like to start it is uh, I like to start with a gesture line and I sort of imagine it like the top of the head a little bit, like you can mess around with this. So I'm going to imagine that she's sort of being pushed by the wind, like Like there's this strong wind blowing from behind for her. And you can see that like I'm keeping it super loose here. It's it's not super amazing. Did I lose my face? I might have lost my face. I'm getting an error message, but that's okay. You don't need to see my face. So we've got this pretty simple like directional flow here. Sometimes I like to put a little bit of an expression. Let's see if we can like have her looking more this way, like she's surprised by where the wind is coming from. And then with this really simplistic pose, then we can start a, we can start to add the silhouette breaks. Uh, so she's got this wind blowing from like sort of behind. So we're gonna have her skirt sort of blowing up this way. And she's got this big ponytail, so we're going to have that sort of also blowing this way to help with that sense of flow. Now, I don't really love what this is doing because it feels too similar to her skirt, so I'm going to actually see if we can get it, something that feels like it flows more naturally here. So we're going to push this, push the hair down a little bit. Now, this is a pretty good start for a pose. And... Another thing I want to bring up is that I think a lot of artists get really stressed out about doing things the right way. Like you get, you see a lot of hullabaloo about like what is the truly legitimate artistic way to do things. And I'm sort of here to tell you that uh, there is no perfectly legitimate way. No way is technically more legitimate than any other. Um, so, um, one saying I've heard that I really like is there are no rules, there are only tools. Like, I'll, I'll write that up here for emphasis. There are no rules, only tools. And changing your mindset in this way will really help you to stress out less when you're working on stuff. Now this is a pretty cute little pose that we have going here. She's got like little, little pointy ears. Now it's pretty simplistic here. So I'm kind of feeling like we can do something else with her leg. Like maybe she's got one leg sort of like up slightly. Like she's she got spooked by something. She's got that kind of, yeah, that's cute. I like that. We're gonna kind of carve out this pose here a little bit. Then we'll sort of adjust the skirt a little bit with the bump of this leg. Now, something that really helps me when I'm working on an early pose like this is when I have like the torso going, I love to put a sort of middle line there so that I can tell the directionality of the torso. That just helps me personally, and I, I, like, I recommend being able to find that, because uh, sometimes you can kind of lose uh, like what direction the torso is facing uh, if you're kind of getting in the weeds. So that's a pretty good pose. So let's try another one. So let's try something a little more action-oriented, maybe. We're going to imagine this kind of like the bottom of our foot. And we're going to make a nice C curve here. Now 
now in this one, it's got a little bit more like this. And maybe, you know, she's working a little magic. She's got her little hand up here. Maybe she's like doing a little snap. Maybe she's doing a little bit more like a, yeah, I like the silhouette of that better. Now you can see that I'm keeping this like super loose, like the anatomy is not perfect here, but it doesn't need to be at this stage. You just need like the feeling of the pose. So I'll give her a little, little smile here. Now we want to keep using this initial C curve as sort of like our guiding light. Like we don't want to like deviate too much from the flow of this pose, even as the pose gets more complicated. So since we have this pose that's sort of like strongly facing this way, we're going to use the motion of her skirt to sort of accentuate it more in this direction and give it that stronger, stronger read. We'll also bring our ponytail back around here. Now, because of the angle of this pose, her, her torso is sort of like strongly facing away this way. So we're going to kind of lose her other shoulder behind there and just have her little hand coming out there. Now you don't have to perfectly follow your C curve, but you want to make sure that it remains sort of at the center of the pose. As you sort of shape things out. Uh, something I find really helpful with, with drawing out legs is, um, so when a leg is straight, like you're looking from it from straight on, you can think of it kind of like a bee, like it's a weird looking bee. Uh, giving it the, like, you know how we were talking earlier about rhythm. There's sort of that one side is straight and one side is curved. Well, that applies for legs too. You find that natural rhythm, like that flow all over the place in anatomy. Like, and that's something that you'll start to notice as you study more and more into it is finding that flow naturally and being able to accentuate it. So you can see here that she's got a simple sign to her leg, and then she's got the more complicated side where her calf dips in uh, and that kind of thing. And when you're drawing a leg from the side, it's actually more of an S curve. It's a little bit more like that. Uh, so you can kind of have the thigh right here. And then I like to put in the kneecap personally. Uh, the kneecap just sort of helps me like orient things a little bit. And then you've got the calf here. That'll help you sort of make poses that feel a little bit more naturalistic when it comes to the legs. like. Personally, I've always struggled with legs. Uh, like, I really have always struggled with legs. So finding ways to sort of, like, simplify them and still have the, the feel that you need uh, personally really helps me. So we'll give her a little bang here. Now you can see that the foreshortening is a little bit weird on this arm, and that's okay. That's not too big a deal at that point. You remember what I was saying, there are no rules, only tools. And something really cool about like being a digital artist is you've got tons of tools. You can select things, you can slide them around, you can liquefy them, and never feel guilty for doing it. Like, it's like if you refuse to use indoor plumbing just because it makes your life easier. Don't do it, there's no point, it'll just make you miserable. Uh, like, use the tools that are at your disposal. So you can kind of... Since this, like, I'm sort of getting rid of, rid of the foreshortening on this arm, I'm just going to shorten this hand. I'm like, I'm going to make this hand smaller so it's a little bit more like she's sort of acting this way. Now, VFX can be an important part of, like, having a cool pose. Uh, so, like, figuring out how your VFX can sort of accentuate the overall composition of your image can be an important thing to learn if you've got a lot of characters who use magic and that kind of thing. 
So let's say she's she's working sort of a flowing magic that's going sort of all around her. Get that feeling of movement there. So it's sort of connecting her hands in a way. So that can be a really cool thing. Uh, I had um, I had an example from Genshin Impact in my slides of like the difference between like production art and like illustration art, and I actually think. <laughs> Like, it's funny saying this, but I actually think gotcha games are really, like, instructive in that regard as to how to craft, like, a truly cool and holistic pose, like, especially with VFX and stuff, because, like, gotcha illustrations are literally there to sell you a character. They have, like, that one shot to really go, like, to, like, make you go, I want to pay money for this character. So looking at the ways that those artists do things is really helpful for making appeal in your poses. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to keep like just pumping out some poses here, just, just thinking about what I'm doing. Uh, we are getting to having like, what, like 20 minutes left. So I suppose I could start taking questions if people want to ask me stuff. All right, perfect. Yes, Rachel, we have quite a few questions. Um, the first of Fire which, away. Perfect. The first of which is, uh, do you have any tips when it comes to creating, putting together a portfolio, especially as a character concept artist? Putting together a portfolio. Um, my main advice there is your portfolio should have in it what you want to do. Like, I should be able to look at your portfolio and know what you want to work on. Like, that's the most important thing, I think, is because I see a lot of, like, uh, prospective concept artists who will have a portfolio that is um, chock full of illustrations. And the illustrations are nice, but they're not the same thing as concept art. Like, a lot of employers are really looking for you to demonstrate that you understand what is needed for the job. Like, you have to be able to draw orthographics of your characters from every angle. You have to be able to provide, like, elementary materials for your, your 3D artists. Um, like, if a character is wearing a pattern, you know, break, do a little breakout of that pattern so that, you know, the people on your team can see it and clearly understand it. Uh, like, all that kind of thing. Like, having a lot of iterations in your portfolio as a concept artist, I think is really important. Like showing your whole design process because that's like 90% of your job. The really polished stuff that you see people post online, that's like the last 20% of anything that you're doing. Uh, it's mostly ugly sketches. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, what do you do when you have trouble pushing a pose? It really depends on what I'm having trouble with. Like, um, sometimes when you're really struggling with something and you've just been pushing it around for so long and you're just getting really frustrated with it, there's no shame in just starting over. Like, sometimes the best thing to do is to get a fresh start on a pose or on a particular, like, a particular image. Uh, and, like... If you're really set on fixing the one that you have, though, uh, here I'm sort of doing one where she's, like, kind of sitting down. Uh, but uh, like if you're really set on fixing the one that you have, make another layer over top of it and sort of see if you can find the, um, the gesture lines of your drawing. And if you can't really find one, like if there's not that strong sense of, of like directionality in your pose, you might just wanna like take it back to square one and rethink it and see if you can figure stuff out. Like it happens to everyone, like never feel ashamed of it. Like sometimes something's just not working and the best thing to do is just to, just to give it another go. Like right now I'm sort of, like, I think I could accentuate the bend of her, her torso a little bit more. So, like, you can see that I've drawn in the C-curve to act as sort of my North Star as I adjust the angle here. Yeah, I'm liking that a lot better. That's already got a way better read. We'll put her big ponytail over her little ears. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. 
The next question is, what if the character is a robot or android? How would you incorporate inhuman stiffness into a character while still making it interesting? Here's the thing about drawing like sort of hard surface characters, and this applies as well to characters that may be wearing a lot of armor, is that like the gesture doesn't really go away. It's just that the individual pieces that construct the whole uh, have a lot harsher shapes. Like you don't necessarily need to completely change your thinking because like say you've got an Ava, like an Ava unit and it's running, it's still going to be making the same major action poses. Like the same things will still apply as would apply to a human body, right? Like. A lot of things are sort of universal in that way when you're trying to portray a sense of motion and like just like a, just in general an appealing pose. So don't overthink it in that regard too much, I would say. Uh, just like almost think of the mechanical bits as as anatomy, right? You still want to find your gesture first. And then draw, like, find the mechanical bits a little bit later, at least in my opinion. Like, I'm definitely not the best at hard surface, but that's how I've always approached it. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, for someone trying to be a concept artist character designer for production, do you recommend having more reference or dynamic poses in your portfolio? Um, is this for games or for animation? Because it sort of differs between. If for games, and you know you're working with like a 3D artist, uh, like being able to comprehensively break down what you're doing, especially if the character is really complicated, like if they're wearing, sorry, I'm taking a drink. If they're wearing a lot of armor, or if they're a mecha character, or if maybe they have a prop that's pretty complicated, like if they have a complex gun or anything, um, then ha having the ability to show like that you deeply understand the material that you're working with and can communicate it to other people on your team, I think is really valuable. Like, I don't think that makes posing in like not valuable. Like, you still need to be able to pose stuff. But when it comes to building a portfolio, you may want to focus a little bit more on like sort of comprehensive like reference aspect of it. Since like as a concept artist, you are primarily a designer, like it may be like sometimes I wonder if concept artist as a title misleads people because you end up doing a lot of problem solving rather than like straightforward art. But uh, yeah, sorry, I ended up rambling on that one. <clears throat> no, that was good. Thank you. Uh, do you need to have an outfit in mind prior to posing your character? Um, you can do it without. Uh, I definitely think like knowing the character's outfit beforehand helps a lot. Like if I didn't know that Flabetta here is wearing a skirt, then like these poses would kind of vibe differently, right? Like I would have to sort of imagine them differently and there's always like the chance that if you draw a character just naked without knowing what they're doing you could accidentally like create a pose that plays very poorly with what they end up wearing like say you've got a character who's like sort of doing like this kind of pose like they're looking at you from behind like you've got like their little booty here if you end up designing a character who's like wearing a short skirt, then you've accidentally created yourself a panty shot, like that kind of thing. Like, obviously that's kind of a weird example, but I think it's better to have an outfit in mind when you're posing a character. When you're going about the process of just designing a character to wear an outfit, it's better to have a pretty basic pose, like just something with like sort of a decent, a decent sense of like that that natural flow, but nothing too over the top. So just like something like this for a character, like when you're actually designing their outfit, will work. You will it'll work just fine because you can clearly see the front of them. Their arms are not in any way like obstructing anything. Uh, 
Get a little smile there. Like they're standing on a pretty flat plane, so there's no perspective that's messing with anything. Like it's a. Uh, I see someone in the chat who asked, "Is my name really spelled Rachel?" Yes, it is. Uh, but yeah, when you're de initially designing a character, I really do think it's best to uh, sort of go for a more basic pose. Uh, something I can actually show an example of in that regard is a. Uh, Where's my little? So, uh, here's a design for an OC that I have. Uh, I did this basic pose here just to draw the outfit on him. Like, just to draw the outfit. I think I have the original. Yeah. So, I had this initial, like, little anatomy doodle of him because he's lanky. I had this initial, like, little doodle of him and then drew the clothes over top of it. And this is just a super simple pose. You can't really tell a whole lot about him at a glance from it. But it's, it makes his outfit really clear to look at, which is really important. Uh, and then, like, I drew him again here, but with a little bit more of a pose going on. It's still not, like, the most posey pose ever. Like, like I was talking about earlier, when you're drawing a character that's a little bit more reserved in personality, it's okay to just have a pose that's a little bit more, like, drawn back. So, uh, yeah, you can have, like... Draw a character multiple times. Like a pose that works for one thing won't work for everything. Like like I said, like when you're working to create reference material, readability comes first. All right. Actually, it seems like we have lost our host. <laughs> I think our host internet cut out. Um, uh, but that's I'm okay. still here. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I can step in and ask the question to you. Um, oh, did we lose Fahim? Uh -oh. Yes, we did. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, he was uh, inside the uh, the chat just letting me know that he has cut out. But that's okay. Oh, oh. no. Oh, I think he is back. I'm back. Can you guys hear me? Welcome back. There you yeah, go. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that, guys. That's okay. Take it away, Fahim. Um, all right, uh, next question. Um, what are some tips when drawing a character with a limited description? Are there steps to take to make them interesting? Like if you're, uh, like, say you're doing a commission for someone and they give you sort of a written description and it's a little bit lacking. Uh, we've all been there. We, we've all been there. Um, Honestly, in that situation, unless they say otherwise, they've basically given you the okay to do a lot of the design work for them. Uh, like, ask for clarification if you can. Um, definitely, like, never feel bad about asking for clarification because communication is a really important soft skill to have in industry art. Um... So never feel bad about asking for more clarification, but like if they just have nothing to add, then honestly follow your heart. <laughs> uh, like sort of intuit what you can about the character and do your best. I wouldn't overthink it too hard. All right, thank you. How would you plan dynamic poses? What are the things you keep in mind to keep the pose eye-catching at first glance? Um, well, I would say that, like, a lot of that comes down to that, like, those strong lines of action, the gesture lines, which are usually a C curve. They can sometimes be an S curve, like, just to design a, a little character with an S curve real quick. We'll do one here like this. So, say she's sort of like... But uh, I would say keeping to these very strong and like these strong statement lines is probably the most important thing to making poses that feel sort of sort of alive in a way and dynamic. Even still, like I really prefer C curves to S curves. This might just be a me thing, but like I just find them a lot clearer. So I'll say that like her skirt's kind of going this way. Oh, did we lose him again? <laughs> we might have lost him again. We might have lost him. Um, that's okay. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, we're, we're good. 
Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. I really prefer working on C curves, though. As you okay. can see, the S curve muddies this a little bit. Okay, go on. All right. The next question. Uh, when you were learning the ins and outs of all this, were you ever frustrated and almost gave up? And how did you overcome it if you were? I'm going to let you in on a secret. Everyone has been there. Like, no matter how amazing their work is, uh, pretty much every artist has probably had a point where they're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Where they're like, you know, like, I'm not meeting my goals, whether they're professional or personal. Like, I'm not, like, I seem like I can't understand things. Like, all of this stuff, like, everybody has been there. Um, like, you may feel like you're suffering alone, but in no way is that experience completely unique. Uh, like, everybody has been there. And when that happens, you know, it's okay to feel bad and to let yourself feel bad for a while. Like, it is, it's a grind. And, like, when you're doing it professionally, like, you're sort of dedicating your whole life to it, right? Uh, so... It's definitely not something to take lightly when you're feeling frustrated. But I think when you reach those points of frustration, um, actually something that I've seen is basically that you can track your art improvement on, on a graph. And it's basically like how you see, like how much you can perceive about the technical quality of art and how you understand it and how you draw like how good are you and basically how you draw is always improving but how you see is also always improving and sometimes they get out of sync with each other like when you're seeing and drawing about the same way you're happy with what you make you're feeling good. But you can get to these periods where, like, sort of how you see is a little bit behind how you draw, and you're like, wow, I'm the best artist ever. Like, I'm improving so much. But then you can get to these situations where how you see is above your art, like, above what you can do. Like, your hand hasn't quite caught up yet. And that's when you hit those art blocks. That's when you feel like garbage. And being able to know that this is a cycle that will repeat your entire life, like you will always be steadily improving, but your perception of your own skill will be changing. Like, just know that this is what's happening to you and you will feel like sort of more empowered to get through it because a lot of people who are just getting started you know they hit the, like one of their first art blocks and they're like is this as good as i can get like is this the best i can do and the answer is no you can always improve you can always find stuff uh but you have to like sort of let things like take their own natural cycle and stuff you need you need to be patient with yourself but you also when you hit those areas, when you feel like you're not improving, it's usually a good sign that it's about time to study something. Like maybe if you feel like your anatomy is not there, then maybe it's a sign that you need to go, you know, take a figure drawing class or you need to, to get down and dirty and do some, do some studying. It sucks. You got to eat your greens, but it will help you feel better. It will help you push through those art blocks. <clears throat> That's some great advice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, what is a silhouette break and how does that affect the overall image? So this is sort of getting into like what I'd call higher level character design stuff. But basically a silhouette break is like, to me, anything on an outfit that breaks from like their basic human silhouette. So like we've got this little, little chick over here. What layer is she on? There she is. So... This is just a human silhouette. Uh, but say she's wearing like a cool, like sort of slit skirt. And uh, the slit skirt, the way that it covers up her body there, to me, that's a silhouette break. That's what I'm referring to when I talk about them. So like knowing the ways that 
when you sort of take a bird's eye view of your character, how those silhouette breaks make them read. Being able to break that down and really understand what works and what doesn't will hugely improve your skills as a designer. Like, you know, you don't want a character that's like so covered in stuff, whether she's, whether they're wearing a massive outfit or they're wearing a ton of armor. Like, you never want to completely lose the human form of the character inside. Now, obviously, like, as I've said, there are no rules, only tools. Like, this doesn't apply universally. This is only really a general guideline. And there are good designs that break that rule. I mean, like, you know, space marines or whatever. But even then, like, their armor is, like, basically just a chunky human form. Uh, so what I'm really talking about when I talk about this is, like, if you were to give her, like giant sleeves and giant pauldrons and like <laughs> all this stuff that's sort of like or like like maybe give her like a giant belt with these big thingies on them and suddenly if you like color this in like if you just look at it from a bird's eye view like you sort of lost the shape of a person on her torso to me, it's important to, like, maintain a little bit. Like, you should see where an outfit tapers in and where it flows out. It all kind of comes back to that feeling of rhythm. Like, the, the sort of ways that, like, a simple thing uh, play off of a complex thing. Like, that flow of things. It applies to the human body. It applies to a design. Like, you never want to completely populate a design with a ton of information. You have to have areas of rest where you can just look. You can just see something simple and understand where you're at. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yes, it does. And, and there's quite a few questions related to drawing clothing or draping clothing and all that sort of stuff. If you have anything else to add uh, to finish off that thought, that'd be fantastic. Or if you have references that you'd like to share or yeah. uh, that you know of, that, that would be fantastic as well. That way the audience so, can get a view. Uh, since I know I'm running out of time here, when it comes to clothes, especially like a lot of drapery, the main thing is having a pretty good understanding of forms. And the lucky thing about understanding forms is that it's a lot like constructing anatomy and that you can break it down into really simple shapes. Um, so like, what is a, what is a skirt? Like we've got a character standing here and she's wearing a skirt. Draw her, draw in her hips real quick. Well, a skirt is basically just something that drapes down around her and it forms a circle at the bottom. Right? Like if you were to make the dress transparent, it would just be a circle basically. Uh, and if you start from understanding like this simple shape, you can go in and you can make it a lot more complicated by adding in the way that things drape. But it's always sort of that same sense of form. Like if the pleats in a skirt, you know, that's just another sort of circle. Like, and then it goes under here. And when in doubt, when it comes to drawing forms, uh, draw through your stuff as if it were transparent and you can really understand it better. So when you're drawing like a skirt pleat, you know, it can kind of feel a little bit confusing, but all you need to know is that it's basically like this ribbon shape. And if you were you if you were to draw it through completely transparently, it would sort of curve like that. So just understand like why your thing is doing the thing it's doing. And you can just draw right through it and get it. That, that's my best advice for that, at least. Like, definitely drawing clothing folds is really complicated. Uh, studying those, like, just for references can help. But in a general sense, understanding why they look the way that they do will help you to draw them more consistently. Uh, okay, I see someone in the you. chat brought up Morpho's clothing book. I also recommend that one. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, since we're down to literally the last minute, uh, we still have several questions that are outstanding uh, but uh, to close off the session do you have anything that you'd like to share any advice um, or anything of that nature before we end the session um 
Like I've heard a lot of questions and a lot, I've seen some chatter tonight about like feeling really unsure of your journey. Like there are a lot of questions that really get across to me this sense of being like sort of overwhelmed by everything that there is to learn. And I think that my like greatest advice in that regard is that like it's okay to feel overwhelmed but just take it one step at a time. Nobody was born knowing everything there is to know about art. No one was like born with this <laughs> magic in them that lets them understand things. The journey of understanding and then uh, in being able to like put to practice what you understand, it's gonna last your whole life. No matter how good you get, you will always find something else to learn. So just recontextualize your art journey you know, in the context of a journey, it will last forever if you keep going at it. Uh, never feel bad about yourself. Like, everybody was an amateur at one point. And, like, where I am, you know, there are people ahead of me, there are people behind me. Like, you know, in that way. Like, someone will want, will see your art and be like, I wish I could draw that way. Just always keep in mind that things are moving in that way and, and like, stay encouraged. That's some great advice. Uh, the It's a marathon, not a race or a sprint, as they would say. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, it takes a lot of endurance. It's definitely not an easy grind, but it can be a fun grind if you let it be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for um, yeah. your session today. Thank, I learned thank a lot, you so much for sure having me. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, and I think we're down to the last slide now. Um, and uh, before we go, don't forget to follow Rachel on social media. Uh, stick around for our special giveaway. You'll find the link in the chat and can enter the giveaway throughout the break. For more details, check out the giveaway link and let the moderator know if you have any questions. We also have many fun videos and tips and tricks during the one hour break. Our next session, Expressions with Miyuli, will start at 2 p.m. Pacific. See you guys soon. And if anybody wants to know more about Rachel, uh, as I mentioned before, please follow her on social media and all of her handles are on your screen right there. Thanks again, Rachel, for your time.